We continue our studies this evening in Ephesians, and particularly we are considering this passage from verse 10, dealing with the Christian warfare and armor. Last week we centered our attention on the Christian warfare, and tonight we want to look more specifically at the armor which God supplies for that warfare. Now I'm very conscious that there may be some areas in which perhaps I might be overlapping some of the things that were said last week and that came to me quite forcibly when I discovered that I'd actually chosen the same hymns as were chosen last week. But I wasn't here last week and as I thought about that I thought of that verse where Paul said in the Philippians to write the same things again is no trouble to me and it's a safeguard to you. So if there is some repetition it must be that surely the Lord has something for all of us here. We're going to talk about the armor, the armor which in verse 13 Paul exhorts us to take up. Take up the armor, the full armor that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And the language which Paul uses there in verse 13 is very incisive. There are five aorist tenses used in the original. And what Paul says is rather curt and crisp. And Hendrickson in his commentary paraphrases it like this. Do not allow the enemy to find you defenseless. Take up your armor. Do so at once without any hesitancy or waste of time. And remember, take up the full panoply. And if you're not just sure what the word panoply means, I looked it up in the dictionary because I was not just too familiar with it. It means the full armor, literally. The splendid array of armor. We're to do it, we're to take it up immediately, says Paul, so that we may be able to resist in the evil day. The day when severe trial, when the evil one brings all his pressure to bear upon you. J.B. Phillips paraphrases that verse, you must wear the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist evil in its day of power. And I think it's important for us to recognize that there is such a thing when evil has its day of power. The whole of our Christian walk and life is a warfare. But there are days, there are times, and sometimes there are long periods when the attack is intensified. Days when it seems as if the evil one has his days of power. When the enemy of souls directs his blitzkrieg against us. And you find yourself suddenly under heavy bombardment. And there's no way of escape. And it's also re easy, sorry, it's also important to recognize that whilst we tend to think of those days being days of difficulty or sickness, tiredness, or even tragedy, we tend to think in those terms of the evil day. And yet the evil day, on the contrary, may be something totally deceptive. Earlier in these passages, Paul has been speaking about the schemes of the devil or the wiles of the devil, and the devil is wily. And what he is out to do on the evil day or the day when evil has his power is to destroy our testimony and to bring about our spiritual collapse. And you see, that may be just as readily brought about by the sunshine of prosperity as by the howling blizzards of adversity. And the blazing sun and cloudless sky can be every whit as dangerous as the chilling frost of winter. The evil day, the day when evil is powerful, is that day when our moral and spiritual life comes under attack and is threatened and Satan, as it were, lays siege to our testimony. And that can happen just as easily when you're lying on a beach at the Costa del Sol as when you're lying at the end of a drip feed in the Royal Infirmary. The day of evil, the day when evil has its power, is that day when temptation comes with more than normal force and with computer-like accuracy is directed at the weakest point in our lives. The other thing I think that it's worth remembering before we look in detail at this armor is that you never know when that's going to happen. You never know when that evil day is going to come. Because if the ma devil is the master of disguise, he is also the master of surprise. 
If he transforms himself into an angel of light, he also pounces silently and comes like a thief in the night. I don't know if you've ever experienced being burgled. Perhaps some of you have. And perhaps you'll know the sense of disbelief and numbness when it's all happened. It all seems so sudden and unexpected. And suddenly you haven't got the thing you had. You put on the armor before the conflict. You see, by the time Belshazzar, of whom we were reading some weeks ago, saw the writing on the wall and the armies of Cyrus had got right under the city along the dry riverbed of the Euphrates, right inside the heart of his city. It was too late for him then to suddenly try and sober up and run and get a few cups of coffee and say, look, I'm going over to the armory to see if I can find something to fight this battle. In the evil day when evil came upon that nation and Belshazzar, he was unprepared. He stood there paralyzed. And Daniel says his face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. The day of power for the evil one had come and he was unprepared. Well, now let's try and look at this armour in more detail. I'll begin to look at the armour in detail. The first thing that I want us to see about this armour is that it is the full armour of God. And therefore it is something we receive from him. It's his and it's not ours. It's not something that we are told to do or work up by our fleshly energy that we might be able to resist the evil one. It is God's armour. It comes from him. Some commentators say that the Roman legionary to whom Paul was chained sits unconsciously for his portrait as Paul presses all the details of his armour into the service of his imagination and speaks of the virtues and graces of the Christian character which are the army of the Christian soldier. And certainly it wouldn't be hard to imagine Paul sitting there as he's writing, doing just that, noting down the various parts of the armour. And yet clearly if he did that, he did it in the light of all that he knew from the Old Testament scriptures and of all that he had seen and heard in the prophecies of Isaiah as was read the, the, this evening from chapter 11. And again, if you turn over to chapter 59 of Isaiah. For Isaiah there pictures the divine warrior, the Messiah himself, coming at a time of evil and crisis. Chapter 59 and verse 14. Justice is turned back. This is a portrayal of the kind of society and situation into which the Messiah is coming. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the street, and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. In other words, the man that seeks to live by truth is the man who is out of step. Now when the Lord saw that, and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice, and he saw that there was no man, and was astonished that there was no one to intercede, then his own arm brought salvation to him. And his righteousness upheld him. And he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. According to their deeds, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries and recompense to his enemies. To the coastlands he will make recompense. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives, and a Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. And the glorious truth is that it is the armour that God wears to overcome his foes that God gives to us to fight, for it's the same fight and the same conflict. And the armour in which our Lord himself was clad is available and effective for us so that we are to enter in to what he does and to what he and for what he supplies for us. As Wesley put it in his hymn, soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal son. It is he who supplies it. 
It is tried. It is tested. And it is God who teaches us how to fight. We have to receive that armor from him. And we do so as we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, as it says in Psalm 91, and it goes on to say that no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. If you go out to battle from any other place other than the secret place, if you are armed with any other arms, then you will be outclassed. You are to stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer, where duty calls or danger. Be never wanting there. And verse 13 back there in chapter 6 of Ephesians says that we are to take up that armor. We are to gird it on our loins. We are to put on the breastplate. We are to put on the shoes. We are to take up the shield of faith. Put on the helmet of salvation and wield the sword of the Spirit. And it's useless unless you do. Surely that armor is effective. It was effective as his son fought against the powers of darkness. Why isn't it always effective in our lives? Is it because we're not inside it? Is it because we know about it? We've studied it. We've read books on it. We've talked about it. We sing about it. But the last thing that we do is put it on. We've got all the answers when people say, How do you fight evil? How do you stand against the evil day? And we say, well, you have to be girt with truth. You have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. But we haven't done it. You see, I think there's a kind of lazy streak, and I speak for myself, that somehow we long that really we wouldn't have to go through the hustle of fighting. If only it were possible for us to be a sort of super-Christian. You know, when the pressure comes and the bullets come at you, then suddenly there's an automatic force field that comes around you and the bullets can't get through. Or perhaps you think if you flung off your spectacles where no one was watching, you might suddenly emerge with a beautiful blue T-shirt with a massive S for Super Christian on it and zap him with your finger. Well, that's nonsense. That's a fantasy. That's the world of comics, the world of TV, the world of the Arabian Nights. And yet I suspect that somewhere there's a sort of longing that it might be like that somehow. But the Bible says it's a warfare and you fight, you sweat. And there will be days of attack and you need the armor of God and you cannot fight without it. You are to take up the full armor and put it on. Otherwise it's useless. It's useless to carry it under your arm. You have to have it on when the evil day comes. Or well, you're like me, you didn't lock the door till it was too late. And you are to do it, it says in verse 13, that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And then, having done everything, to stand firm or as the revised standard version says you are to do it so as to withstand and then having done all to stand you see there is victory but there is no discharge in this warfare you are to resist the devil it's the same word used in James and he will flee from you but you forget sometimes the first part of that verse in James 4 7 which says submit therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you in other words if you are submitted to God if you are living in that position of obedience and submission to him, if you're inside the armor, if you've taken it up and put it on, then as you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Remember, though victory is promised, the enemy of souls returns to fight again. You have that surely in our Lord's experience. And Luke is the one, I think, who says particularly that after the devil had been tempting our Lord, he left him till a more opportune time. There was that battle, there was that conflict, and the devil for a season left him. And he waited for a more opportune moment. And you can see it through the story of our Lord's walk on life when he came back with all his weaponry fighting again at Caesarea Philippi, 
when perhaps our Lord's heart was full of joy at the thought that his disciples had realized who he was. Blessed be thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then in comes the devil. When Jesus says, I have to go to the cross, and Peter says, oh, no, no, no. And Jesus immediately flashes back, get thee behind me, Satan. So that in a moment, when there was sunshine, as it were, the devil was there to attack. And at the moment when our Lord was going through that excruciating agony on the cross, again, the same temptations are coming back to him. If you're the Son of God, come down and we'll believe you. Prove it. We are to resist and then to stand, remembering that we must be prepared. The price of peace is eternal vigilance. And so in verse 14, Paul tells us how we are to stand. He says we are to stand having girded on, having put on, having been girded. It's no good thinking about girding yourself tomorrow. It's no good thinking about, well, when I go to work tomorrow morning, I will try and do what we've been exhorted to do from the scripture. It's now and before we leave this place. That we are to be girded, having put on the armor of God. And I think it's interesting that the first part of that armor to which Paul refers is not the flashy sword or the shining breastplate, but it's the humble girdle. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. You will realize in these verses that there are two types of weapons. Most of the weapons are defensive and there is one offensive weapon that is the sword of the spirit but the pride of place in the weaponry at this point goes to the girdle. Now some commentators again say that Paul was thinking of the Roman legionary and say that uh, what he was referring to was the belt that the Roman soldier had around his middle to hold his armor in place, to hold the tunic in place the belt from which the sword was hung and the belt that kept him together and enabled him to function. John Stott says in a way it's hardly a part of the armour, it's a hidden part of the armour, more related to the underwear than to the armour because it's not the thing you would immediately notice about the man. You don't immediately notice a man's belt, I trust. Not the thing you immediately look at. But here it's a foundation like the foundation upon which we are to build. And it's necessary for that foundation to be firm and solid, rock-like, true truth, truth acted upon. As Jesus reminded us in the Sermon on the Mount. And yet I wonder if there's another picture that we can see here in the scriptural use of this word being girded. I notice that the NIV says, having the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Jesus speaks about it in Luke 12 when he says about the servants waiting for the master to return. They were girded about. They had their garments tightened up, ready for action. Let your loins be girded around. Ready for action. Clothing tightened so that it doesn't catch on every twig on the road. Gird it up so that it doesn't get in the way. I see a similar use of that in Hebrews 12 where it speaks about laying aside every encumbrance in the Christian race and the sins which easily and suddenly entangle us and trip us up. Because that's what happens if your garments are not girded around you. If it's not tightened around your waist. If you're going to survive in the fight, you've got to be girded up. That garment has got to be tightly wrapped around you. Otherwise it'll drop down. And then what will happen? Shame. Exposure. Or you'll trip up. You know Cyrus, my servant Cyrus, whom I take by my hand, he was the one with the armies of Darius who came and tackled that debauched Belshazzar. How does Isaiah speak of his actions? Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, my anointed, whom I've taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to ungird, says the revised standard, the loins of kings. 
And as one American friend once said, we would say over there, he said, he came to scare the pants off them. Because they were unguarded, they were not prepared. What is it that keeps you ready for action in God's service? What is it that holds you together? What is it that keeps you from stumbling? What is it that braces you for the conflict? What is it that will keep you from being exposed? It's to be guarded securely with the truth of God. And I think there's something very simple here. Because I think if you're living dishonestly and if I'm living a lie and if there's some secret part of my life, some private chamber of horrors, then in biblical terms I am unguarded. I'm in danger of losing my clothing and my armor. And the enemies of souls will see to it that the truth will out. He will ungird the loins and you will be exposed. And worst of all, and this is what the enemy of souls is aiming at, the testimony will be destroyed because he doesn't care what means he uses. He doesn't follow any rules from any Geneva Convention. He doesn't care if you're tempted by sex or by money or by prestige or by ambition. What he's out for is your downfall and the downfall of the kingdom of God. And he will lead you into believing that you can go on with this double standard, with this dishonesty in your heart. He will say to you, like he said to David, why don't you take a walk out there in the palace? The scenery is good, you know. Take a break. You've been working hard. And David, it's okay if you take this uh, lady over to your house. After all, her husband's off at war and nobody's going to know about it. Well, David, don't worry about the way things are going. I know it looks a little bit difficult, but you can arrange it so that Uriah sleeps with his wife and then everybody will think it's his child. But then, David, don't give up now that Uriah doesn't want to do that. Why don't you just arrange it nicely and neatly so that Uriah gets killed in the battle and then you can take Bathsheba and you can marry her and you see it'll all be legitimate and above board and nobody will know. You can live with that double standard, David. Nobody knows what's going on, you know. You've hidden it so well. But the loins of the king were uncut. There was no truth in his inner heart. And when the Spirit of God through the prophet Nathan comes to David, David's heart cries out to God and he says, Oh God, you desire truth in the innermost being. God, I've had a double standard in my life. There's not been any integrity in my heart. I've been living a lie. And that secret compartment that I cherished has destroyed me. Well, the enemy is out. To ungird our loins. But if we have a double standard, then we shall neither resist the devil, nor shall we be able to stand firm in the battle. For if we live like that, then the belt is slack, the cloth is ungirded, and we are vulnerable and open to defeat, open to satanic blackmail. You see, when we resort to hypocrisy, or deceit or intrigue we are trying to play the devil at his own game and in his game he holds all the aces you will not beat him on his own ground you will not stand firm you'll be wobbly what says James an un, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways one thing which will put the prince of darkness to flight is transparent honesty. He hates that light. He hates the truth. And that's why we're to walk in the light and we're to walk in the truth and to abstain from every appearance of evil. That's why for Christians there are things you do not do. There are places that you do not go to. There are associations that you do not make. Because you are to be transparently honest. God said to Abraham, walk before me and be Perfect. And the word really means lurus. Sorry, the Indonesian word that is. It means straight, honest, man of integrity. Somebody said it takes a conscious twist of the mind to live a lie or to tell a lie. And that's how some of those lie detectors could function. 
because it was possible to measure the physical effort required. But I believe that it will consume a man or a woman and eat away their mental health if they live a lie. And no man can be strong on the outside if there's that cancer of a double standard and a deceit that is eating away inside the heart. You are to gird up your loins that you don't trip up. You are to gird up and feel the difference of peace and the strength that comes when you walk in truth. I believe too that if we are living with a double standard that God will bring us warnings again and again. Tugs, if you like, at the sarong. But we ignore those warnings at our peril. Because there will come a day when the sarong falls if the truth is not girt about us. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. That takes an act of repentance. And repentance means turning around and going in totally the other direction. If there is this dual standard in your life or mine, then the Lord calls us to gird on truth, to be the same on the inside as we are on the outside, and to turn away for he desires truth in the innermost being. And that's the prerequisite for success and standing in the evil day I have seen some of the tragic results of that double standard in the life of Christians I remember once a missionary too weeping when things had gone wrong and it was clear that that person was totally unsuited to missionary life sobbing and saying, you know, I pulled the wool over the eyes of the selection committee. I acted out a part. I played a role. I deceived them. God graciously overruled and brought that person through. But how tragic. If you're wanting to move forward in obedience to the will of God for your life, you don't have to play a part. You don't have to pretend. God will honor that honesty. And if he's not wanting what you want, then you would be a fool to try and engineer things to go your way. You would be ungirded for the conflict. For it's no way to live for God and no way to fight for him unless there is truth in the innermost being. So there's that simple, straightforward, I believe, meaning of the word. The New English Bible and the Jerusalem Bible translate this word here, integrity, and that's the word. But there's surely another dimension, for it's not just subjective heart truth that we are to gird on, but it is also objective doctrinal truth, because you cannot truly have true truth if you divorce the one from the other. And when you read Paul's description of all the various parts of the armour, the breastplate of the righteousness, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, you see that all these various parts of the armor are characterized by truth. And in fact, the division between the meaning of the various parts of the armor is not watertight. They overlap. As indeed the parts of armor must overlap to give you that protection as well as the mobility. But surely one of the obvious things is that if we are fighting the father of lies, the one who is the deceiver, what we need to dispel his lies is the truth of God. And the point here is it is the truth of God as a living reality. Not as just a mental checklist of truths that we've learned or heard in church. But it's God's truth understood, obeyed, lived by, acted upon, worked out in our experience. It is that which becomes a weapon against the evil one. We are to eat it and to drink it, to breathe it and to bathe in it till our minds are renewed by it. Says Paul in Colossians, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom. Thy word, says the psalmist, I have 
treasured in my heart that I may not sin against thee. And it was this that our Lord prayed for his disciples. Oh, Father, he says, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. It is to shape our minds. It is to renew our minds. We're not to be squeezed into the world and its mold, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, by the word of God heard, understood, and obeyed thinking the other day how difficult it is in some pagan cultures to get people to understand that that it isn't just knowing about the word of God or having a Bible which is your security that the vital truth of the spiritual relationship is that this word put into action and obeyed you see in eastern situations sometimes they have a totally different idea of the word of God and perhaps you'll think if I describe these things to you that that could never happen here, but I wonder. You might go into a Buddhist temple and see a man kneeling before an image and in his hand is a bamboo tube. And in that tube there are a series of sticks with numbers on it. And he sits there or kneels there in front of the Buddha shaking these tubes until one stick falls out at the foot of the idol. That stick he then picks up and he goes down to the far end of the temple where there is a little priest sitting. He pays his money and there in front of the priest there are a honeycomb of pigeonholes and in each one of those pigeonholes is a verse for the day. And he takes the verse that corresponds to the number of the stick that fell out before the idol. And he takes that verse and he stands on that as the truth by which he will live that day that may guide him in his investments guide him as to where he goes guide him as to whether he gets married or not a sort of promise box concept of the Bible that's not wearing the truth of God that's not being girt about with the word of God or perhaps they will take their Bibles and they will, they will put it on top of their money boxes believing that it has some power to protect the money. Or if the child is sick, they will put it into the bed, as they used to do with pagan charms, believing that there's some magical power in that Bible that somehow or other will bring healing to that child. You see, that's a pagan usage of the Word of God. And you say, well, that doesn't happen here in the West, doesn't it? I think it's tragically possible that it does happen that people do things that are not too far removed from that. Or they put the word of God in some position and say, well, when things get rough, I better turn to it quick and try and find out what I'm to do in this situation. But you see, that's not being girded about with the truth of the word of God. Jim Phillip, in his commentary on the spiritual warfare, gives us a practical example of what it really means to be girt about with the truth of the word of God. He says, perhaps you've been reading one morning 1 Corinthians 13 and you read, Love uh, suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love thinketh no evil. And you think, well, that's precious. And you gird that about yourself as you go out that day. You take that word to be the Lord's word to you. You meditate upon it and you, you let it grip your life. And then you sit down and you hear somebody say something careless about you. Perhaps it was a joke. And you imagine that perhaps there was a nasty spirit behind what they said. That someone is trying to slight you or belittle you. When all the while it was just an unfortunate turn of expression and nothing negative was really intended. Because that's the way so often that misunderstandings arise. And then you begin to allow yourselves to brood on what was said until it affects your whole outlook and spoils the whole day. You see, you've forgotten the word of the Lord to you that morning. Love thinketh no evil. You've started to think evil. You've put the worst possible construction on what you had. No offense was meant or intended, but the loins have become ungirded. And the devil has got in to have your loins girded with God's truth is to be impregnable in a situation like that 
sure there are many illustrations that we could find. We read from Isaiah 11 of the coming Messiah where it says that righteousness is as a belt or a girdle around him. And surely you see that when our Lord was under attack by the devil in the wilderness, he was wrapped around in the truth of the word of God. So much so that when the devil took a truth out of the context of the word of God and turned it into a lie, which is one of his strategies, and sought to pierce our Lord's armour, immediately our Lord was so deep in the truth the whole counsel of God that he could set those misquoted words from scripture into the total context of God's truth and God's word and he was impregnable against those attacks because he was steeped and soaked in the truth, the whole truth of the word of God that was his armour that was his protection in the day of evil and that is our protection Well, that is the armour that is made available to us. You see, I think it's very important to remember that Satan will certainly try to attack our grasp of the truth of God's word. He would love to quote a verse to you to drive you in the wrong direction. That's where you need to be girt about with the whole counsel of God and the word of God he started out that way in the garden of Eden did God really say that did he really say that you would die you won't die you see a little truth but a lie are you sure God said that and what the devil is out to do is to, to loose us from our conviction that it is God's truth it is God's word he will do it by quoting a truth now you must fight back by quoting the truth the whole truth set it in the context of the whole counsel of God and if he can't get you to have reservations on an intellectual level then I believe he will get you to have reservations on a practical level and something may come into your life and you may be tempted to think surely how could this possibly have happened didn't God promise this and didn't God promise that now look at it devil comes to you and he says are you sure God really said that are you sure you can really trust it even if he did say that and he brings this devastating and demoralizing attack he raises reservations in your mind not only about the authenticity of the word of God but also the efficacy of the word of God and if we are to stand fast in the warfare we are to be held fast by the whole truth of the word of God even when your understanding from a human point of view seems contrary James Phillips says even when your own intelligence seems to have the final answer back the integrity of the word of God against the validity of your intelligence every time remember that your intelligence is a fallen thing the word of God is God breathed and therefore authoritative if the devil can disarm us there we shall not be able to resist him nor to stand how is it with us tonight are your loins girded around with the truth of God's word? Or are there insidious doubts of the fiery darts of the evil one coming into your mind? Are your loins girded around with integrity or is there still a double standard in your life? Tonight if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Remember he comes like a thief in the night. Don't let him find you defenseless. Don't dream of some magical solution someday. It's a battle and a warfare. We are to take up the armor. We are to take it up at once with no hesitation, no delay. 
For now is the day of salvation. Now let my soul arise and tread the tempter down, we say. My captain leads me forth to conquest and a crown. A feeble saint shall win the day, though death and hell obstruct the way. Should all the hosts of death and powers of hell unknown put their most dreadful forms of rage and malice on, I shall be safe, for Christ displays superior power and guardian grace. Take up the armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. Gird up your loins with truth. Do it now for your own sake and for his name's sake.